And this assignment is for Dr. Lomax 550 course, in the Doctorate of Ministry program at the Interdenominational Theological Center. My name is Ayana Tillman. I am joined today by Patricia M, Jason T, and Norman G. And we have shortened and adjusted the names to uh, uh, maintain the anonymity of those being uh, interviewed in this discussion. So I'd like for each uh, of our uh, guests to introduce themselves and share anything about uh, their ministry context background. Uh, prior to them doing so, I'd like to note that the three conversation partners uh, share a similar ministry context with, uh, with I, uh, where we work, serve, uh, and have led communities uh, that engage children, youth, and young adults. So I'll let each of them introduce themselves and share a little bit about what it means to them to be Black and uh, Christian or whichever faith denomination or uh, faith base they connect with. Please share. As for me, and Norman G. I have a long contact with uh, young people. I served as a school teacher in the middle schools and in the high schools, and also directed specialized program. Uh, that was funded by the federal government to assist low-income and first-generation high school students to prepare them to move on further after high school, preferably into a four-year college, but it could also be a two-year college with the intent to move on then, those young people to move on then to a four-year college. Also, I've also worked as a Sunday school teacher for many, many, many years. Um, and also was at one time, I directed the uh, youth chapter of the NAACP in the county where I was uh, residing at that time. Thank you, Norman G. Sounds like you have uh, quite a bit of, uh, of experience. What, what for you, uh, what does it mean to be Black and Christian? Link the two of them together. For me, that is as if it's one. Uh, I've not known um, any other race for myself other than Black. Uh, uh, many of the opportunities that I talked about earlier or quote unquote, if, uh, I can say segregated uh, activities, the public schools where I taught, it was doing a segregation. I was black. I also taught in that same county when they first integrated, um, I was sent to the high school where then it was both black and white and I was black. Um, even though at that time, you know, uh, everyone was treated, at least I treated everyone the same. Uh, at that time, it was not what we consider a separation of church and state. So if it were necessary for me to bring in my Christianity, then I did so, be it in the classroom or be it in faculty staff meetings. So I've only known my Christianity based on my, uh, based on my race, uh, which I was very, even to this day, very proud of. Uh, I will continue to serve all communities because at times some of the programs that I've worked in were multicultural. So I've got a, uh, a side that, you know, <laughs> as we say, knows no color, even though I recognize, uh, yes, black, white, otherwise, but that did not hinder me from being able to do 
be it my educational duties or my Christian duties. So I'm, I'm blended into one. When I say that, blended into being black, being blended into being a Christian, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, combining all races together and executing my jobs. Yes, yes. Uh, Patricia M., how would you respond uh, after you share a brief bit of your background uh, as it relates to Black children, youth, young adults? Uh, what does it mean for you to, when you hear Black and Christian? Okay, um, in terms of children, um, I attended the University of Maryland College Park and studied in the Institute of, for Child Study. Um, the program was framed with six components to it. And I would just give the name of the components and highlight some of the aspects of those components. And um, the first one is physical factors and looking at a child and how he develops um, humanistically. Physical handicaps and limitations is one of the things that we looked at in terms of looking at the physical factors, health habits, appearances and grooming, etc. The second area that we studied was affectional relationships, love. And we looked at the directions that this went in. For example, mother to subject, father to subject, special friends, pets, family constellation in the affectional zone. The uh, third component was socialization. Factors, subcultures carried by the subject, masculine, feminine, rural to suburban, race, social class, etc. values of the school, values of the teaching, values of the home. The fourth component was peer group factors. We studied the characteristics and activities of the peer group, mobility of the peer group, roles played in the peer group, et cetera. Number five, we studied the self-developmental factors, the development of intelligence, action relationship to environment, skills and symbolizing elements, et cetera. B of that same component was cognitive processes and cumulative experiences and meanings, remembering experiences, goals and new social groupings, learning to analyze events, self-organizing factors and concept of self. And number six was self-adjusted process. So in that particular area, we studied situations and experiences that evoke pleasant or unpleasant emotional behavior in children. So that's the sixth area of framework. It was developed by Daniel Prescott, who was the founder of the Institute of Child Study at the University of Maryland Eastern, uh, excuse me, College Park. Uh -huh. now, uh, how would terms, you... Excuse me. You had a question? No, go ahead, please. Okay. Now, what it means to be Black and Christian. First of all, to be black means to be a part of the original race, which is African and to be a member of the first human gene pool, to have the genetic ability to produce sufficient amounts of color, which we call melanin, which means black. A dominant aspect of the black mentality reflects the principle of the oneness of being. To be black is to recognize that a philosophy of rhythm and harmony, one with nature, survival of the collective self and the tribe. Now the ethos for that is I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am, meaning we are the extended self. That's what it means to be black to me. To be a black Christian means our ontological position asserts that there is more to the world than meets our material eyes. We recognize a non-material, a spiritual reality underlying all observed material and phenomena. Whether one calls this non-material reality energy, spirit, manner, prana, or whatever, 
what is important is that we believe as black people that it exists. Mm -hmm. In other words, we accept man as a divine spiritual being. Even though Western observers have historically described these assumptions as primitive, heathenistic, superstitious, or pagan, to be black is to understand behavior as an extension of a spiritual core. Finally, um, this implies to me that existence of an element in man which has a divine origin, eternal fate, and a moral function. That is my conception of to be Christian and black. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Jason T, uh, speak a little bit, bit about uh, that framework and perspective um, from your lens, um, how you center your work uh, involving black children, youth, young adults, and what it means for you when you hear uh, Christian and black, black and Christian. Um, sure. Um, to start off, I have two very young children right now, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And my perspective is, has had to shift from just my own understanding to how to pass it to children of my own. Um, and that's a very um, big responsibility because I know what it has meant in my life and the things that it has given me. So I need to take that that responsibility very seriously. Um, I've also tutored college kids. Um, and that's a completely different perspective when it comes to uh, what it means to be Black and what it means to uh, be Christian and Black. Because um, at that stage, you're beginning to form really who you are as an adult. You begin to understand things a lot more. Um, and even from my change from that age to you know where I was being able to tutor those kids it was interesting just hearing um just the different perspectives and some of the things that were the same um from mine and some of the things were different um through the church worked with kids of all kinds of different ages um through church plays youth groups and um just different activities and you can see the difference between the very, very young, the school age, and then as they get older, just their understanding of what it means to them. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit of that <clears throat> from what it means to be Black and Christian. Um, from the earliest stage, you know, it was, it meant what it means to most kids. You go to church, you know, <laughs> every Sunday you go to church. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're home, you go to church. If you go to your grandmother's house, you go to church and you stay there for as long <laughs> as they have you stay there. That's mm -hmm. what it meant to you. And it meant that Jesus was good. You said your grace, you said your prayers. That's what it mostly meant as a, a young kid. You went to church, you said your grace, you said your prayers. especially in, in, in a black Christian church. Um, I noticed there seems to be a, a focus, especially on getting the youth to understand. Mm -hmm. It meant going to Sunday school and you learn more lessons in Sunday school. You began to get assignments to read mm -hmm. your Bible and to understand things. Um, and then to give your perspective as to how you understood it. And you began to hear other people's perspective as well. And it made you think a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm and what it meant in, in your life. Um, and then as I got older, it, be, it you got to form your own relationship um, mm -hmm. with God. It was, it was about what you prayed for. You, you started to learn not to pray for the things you prayed for as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, for school would get canceled or things like that. You started to realize <laughs> that it was bigger than that. Um, and especially when it comes to the black culture, because the things that you knew, if you didn't know anything else, was Black people love God. That, <laughs> that was a major thing. You didn't know anybody. I almost didn't know anybody who wasn't Black and Christian. 
every now and then you you meet uh, a Muslim, but more mm -hmm. often than not, everybody you knew, all of your friends um, were black and Christian, your, your, your whole group of people. Um, and then again, like, you know, the relationship, I guess, for, for being black people, what it meant to be black is that you have kind of a relationship that's just born within you. I mean, mm -hmm. without even knowing each other, a head nod needs no explanation. You know, mm -hmm. we call each other brother and sister right off the bat. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when we're, when I go somewhere, we look to see if we can find each other in a place. We know where each other is. And that's because it doesn't matter where I am. Mm -hmm. um, and you do hear a lot of thank God. You know, you do mm -hmm. notice when people kneel, or I'm sorry, uh, bow to pray. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of, uh, and you assume that that's who they're praying to. They're Black and Christian. And, and there is kind of a connection um, with that. Mm -hmm. Automatically. You. I, you, you brought up something that is a, is a great segue. Um, as we have about six or seven more minutes to kind of uh, uh, engage this discourse. Uh, one of the, the books we're reading as doctoral students at the ITC is called Afrocentric Christianity, a Theological Appraisal for Ministry. And it's written by J. D. Otis Roberts. <clears throat> and on page 61, he speaks about an Afrocentric perspective on Christianity. And each of you and your explanations have touched on, but I'd like you to expound and elaborate a bit uh, with regard to what I'm gonna share now from page 61. Afrocentric perspective on Christology. Some approaches to Christology began with the cross and resurrection. Little attention is given to the earthly life of Jesus. Black religion, insofar as the acceptance of the Christian revelation is concerned, has paid strong attention to the place of Jesus in the believer's life. Being treated so inhumanely by other human beings, African-American Christians see Jesus as a divine friend to whom they could turn in the time of trouble. In fact, as Washington, Joseph Washington, who wrote Black Religion, describes Black religion, it might well be called Jesusology. He argued that we had no substantial theology or ecumenical vision. So as we are uh, identifying as Black people who serve in communities with children, youth, and young adults, how do you or have you or do you plan in the future in your work? How do you plan to encourage or how do you plan to engage this idea of uh, African people or Black people having no substantial theological or ecumenical vision? How do you frame that? And how do we begin to um, move uh, that perspective into our communities with our, with our children? So what are your thoughts on, on that? And uh, just discuss a little bit about uh, this idea, your thoughts on the idea that uh, Black folk uh, have no substantial theology or ecumenical vision. I just simply, uh, this is Patricia M. I just simply want to say that I believe that self-knowledge, which is wisdom, I think that to study and become aware of yourself spiritually as far as spiritual intelligence is concerned, the knowledge of self, we say know thyself. And I think mm -hmm. that is an area where we need to do more study, research, and you know, impacting our children on self-knowledge mm -hmm. and intelligence. Uh, for, for the last few minutes, um, Norman or Jason, would you like to weigh in on um, uh, the, the next line in this reading says that Gayard Wilmore reminds us that the concept of the Black Messiah has been around a long time. What are your thoughts on that as we uh, go to the, we're going to go all the way until the end of the Zoom meeting until it cuts us off. <laughs> 
What are your thoughts on the concept of the Black Messiah? That is something that um, I want to use the term previously has really not been in the forefront of the Black community, the Black Messiah. Uh, very, I'm going to say very few people, especially very few Black people, uh, even uh, they've, they've never been aware of uh, the Black Messiah, nor what uh, 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 what what that entails. That's a new uh, concept. I can use that uh, even as late as the the eighties. It's never been taught per se in the Black Church. So therefore, if it hasn't been taught in the Black Church, then very few Black people uh, are, are even aware of that. Uh, I think it needs to be. Uh, taught, and then therefore this younger generation can be aware of what it means when we say the Black Messiah, what all does that entail? So it's quote unquote, in a sense, uh, our ignorance, uh, because we were not informed of that, uh, say when we were growing up, number one, as children, and if we if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't mentioned when we were children, then we very likely did not pick up on that, even it, as far as our adult adult life is concerned. But yes, it needs to be it needs to be taught presently. Mm -hmm. And Norman, I, I heard you mention uh, your during your time, quote unquote. What era, if you don't mind sharing, um, are you speaking of in terms of? Um, um, in terms of uh, uh, information not being disseminated with regard to the Black Messiah? What era did you? Uh, I, I, I taught in the uh, public school systems in the 60s and parts of the 70s. Um, yes, now that you could not teach in the public school system within the life of the Black church and I basically attended the same church from uh, my adolescent age, even up to the present age. And the, the teachings of the Black Messiah or even the, the knowledge related to Black Messiah was never entered into as far as, you know, in that particular Black church. And that particular Black church, I think, uh, typifies um, uh, the average church, even though we say where I grew up was rural, but even in and, and, uh, being on the college campus and what have you for uh, 30 years, <clears throat> I never heard young people say anything about the Black Messiah. And even now, I, I don't hear them speak up, and I'm still in communication with college students and you don't hear them speak of that. But at the same time, many of them attend the same church that I presently attend where I, where I was, where I attended as a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jason, um, what about you? In terms of the Black Messiah, any awareness or what are your thoughts and discussion? Um, I think, uh, I kind of agree with with what was said before. It, it, it's not really taught. I mean, we know the line, even in, in the Bible, the hero. Mm -hmm. You never mm -hmm. see, even in even in the black church, Jesus on our fans is white. Jesus on our paintings has long brown hair and light skin. Like we we, we never truly see it enough to make it believable. And especially when you're talking about youth and kids, it's it's got to either be seen a lot or pumped into their head consistently, and that doesn't happen. And 
I don't know if it's we're now conditioned to believe that it's not possible that that the Messiah must not be, you know, black. I, and I I hate for it to be that way, but it seems that that is the way it is because if you show many kids between the ages, of, you know, from the beginning through high school and ask them to pick out which one is closer looking to Jesus, closer looking to the Messiah, they're, they're not going to pick um, anyone that looks like them. Mm-hmm. It's, and yes, it is definitely something um, that we need to do better with, but we, we kind of, we kind of have a different way of doing it in the culture now. I think um, there was even uh, a movie um, called, I can't remember, something in the Black Messiah, but it was it was more figures from our civil rights movements that are starting to maybe they can uh, push into the mind of youth that a savior can be someone who, you know, looks like them. So I think we are, we have a chance to approach it. Um, we're starting to see more people stand up um, and we're seeing them more, I guess, in the form of, like I said, speakers right now, your, your Malcolm X's, Martin Luther King, um, you're starting to see more people speak out. And I think as you gain more confidence that you aren't the second culture, that you are right there on top, then it is much easier for people to believe um, that it will happen. And, and it will start with the youth. The youth are pushing for that mm-hmm. now. They're, they're, their confidence is rising. I mean, you can mm-hmm. see it. So if it is going to happen, it will definitely be probably this this next few sets of generations of youth mm-hmm. um, for them to believe, for them to honestly believe that. Yeah. yeah. I... I- I'd I'd like like to... Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, um, I, I'd like to, I'd like, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please, Patricia. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Um, okay, and we have, um, I don't know if you can see, can you see the timer counting down about three minutes? Yeah, two, 250. Okay, yeah. Please, please, um, please go ahead and take us out. Quickly, um, I remember John Henry Clark saying, People argue that it doesn't matter what color uh, the Messiah is. He said, but in paintings and pictures and in conceptualizing who the black Messiah is or who Jesus is, that Jesus should look like the person who's painting him or he should look like the person based upon what color they are. Um, I remember stumbling up on um, an Ethiopian picture, an ancient picture of uh, a black Jesus with dreadlocks. The first one I ever saw, maybe about 20 years ago, I saw Mm -hmm. this picture and it was very old, but it was depicted from the Ethiopian and it looked like them. And that's Mm -hmm. the point that John Henry Clark was making about it. Um, okay, well, with the, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and with our last few minutes, and with our last few minutes, I'd like to just finish with, um, and, and I, I noticed that the civil rights movement came up uh, as, at the, as, Jason, uh, as Jason T was talking. And I'd like to uh, just close out with this as much of it as I can read. As early as 1829, Robert Alexander Young spoke of a Christ figure who would champion the calls of the degraded of the earth. And this is from Afrocentric perspectives and Christian theology. In 1949, long before the recent black theology movement, the mystic and religious philosopher Howard Thurman wrote a classic statement on the place of Jesus among black believers. However, insofar as Christianity and the black church tradition is concerned, this volume still holds its own. Jesus and the disinherited has claimed the attention of black ministers and religious scholars since it was written. Thurman seems to have captured the essence of the meaning of Jesus for black people. Martin Luther King Jr. is reported to have carried this volume with him as he traveled. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, for sharing and enlightening us in your context of ministry. I appreciate your time, 
the work and service you're doing in our communities. And I ask that God continue and spirit continue to strengthen you to the work you are called to do as you answer your call. Thank you again for your time and for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.